you can build a really unscalable no-code app on Bubble, or you can build a scalable app. The question is, what differentiates the two? If you're building a no-code app on Bubble, you might have looked at examples of other apps and found that some of them don't perform well. And that might have left you worried about the future of your own no-code app. But the reality is, when it comes to development, there are many ways to achieve the same thing. Some ways are going to be right, some ways are going to be wrong, and whether something is right or wrong really depends on your own use case. So today we're gonna break down what makes a scalable, well-performing app on Bubble. This video is going to look at this from two perspectives. One from the internal development perspective. What are things that you might be doing or not doing that are creating an unscalable development experience for yourself? And on the other side, we're gonna be looking at external experience and scalability. What might you be doing or not doing that is creating a underperforming experience from a user's perspective? Make sure you stick around until the end because there's actually one thing that is gonna make up about 99% of your app's scalability. It's one you don't wanna miss. If you're new around here, my name is Kristen. I'm the co-founder of Coaching No Code Apps. We help non-technical entrepreneurs build custom apps so they can start their app-based business or grow their existing business all without coding. When it comes to scalability with your Bubble app, you have to differentiate between developmental scalability and front-facing scalability from a user's perspective. So whether or not the app is performing for your users. Okay, so from the development side of things, what we're really looking at are development best practices. This is not rocket science, but it's stuff that a lot of people overlook because when you're building an app for the first time, you don't know what you don't know. So there are four developmental best practices we're gonna go over. And the way I want you to look at these is if you are starting the development of your app and you create a certain number of pages, you create a certain database structure, workflows, et cetera, on a small scale, if you are not implementing these development best practices, you're probably not going to notice any inefficiencies with your development because you're working on a small scale. But as your app grows and expands and when you start bringing users on board and adding, and adding more features, these bad development practices that you start with will compound over time and ultimately leave you with a back-end development workspace that you cannot scale. And so if you start with these developmental best practices, they're going to set you up for long-term success. Talking about Bubble specifically, the first one relates to your issue checker. As you start and continue building your app, you're going to notice issues starting to pop up. And over time, those are going to rack up. We've seen people with dozens and even hundreds of issues. Now, sometimes it can feel like these issues are things that you're going to leave for later. You know, once you finish this initial development and you're ready to deploy your app, you'll come back, fix up all those loose ends, and then go ahead and publish. But your issue checker is there for a reason, and you really need to be clearing those issues as you go. If you decide to clear your issues all at once, the most obvious problem with this is just having a major mess on your hands because yeah, some of those issues are going to be easy to clear, but some of them are going to be more complicated. And if you leave this big mess of issues for you to clear out all at once, it's going to feel like a whole other project just to get your app deployed when you feel like you're, you're nearing that finish line. So don't leave yourself with a mess like that on your hands at the very end. But the more important reason is because smaller issues can lead to bigger problems. And if you're not clearing those smaller issues, you're going to start seeing those bigger problems, but you're not going to be able to identify the root cause of them. When you can't identify the root cause, chances are you're going to end up patching things instead of fixing the underlying issue itself. For example, I recently moved into a new house and in the upstairs, there are cracks that you can see starting to form around the door frames. And I can see where previous owners have gone in and patched over these cracks so that you just can't see them. But in reality, the root problem is that there needs to be a jack 
under the home so that the settling can be relieved. That's just happened over time. Now I could go and fix all of the issues that are related to that settling that has happened. I could patch over these cracks. I could fix some of the door frames, but patching all those things up is just going to lead to other problems because the root problem is still there and it's still having a ripple effect throughout the house. So you could have issues in your app that are causing other issues, ripple effects. And if you try to patch everything, not knowing that there is actually a root cause that you just haven't uncovered, then you are constantly going to be doing extra work in your app. All right, the next thing that is going to lead to an unscalable development workspace is not labeling your elements within your editor as you build your app. When you create different elements, Bubble is going to give them a default name. And over time, you're going to end up having hundreds, if not thousands upon thousands of elements throughout your entire app. If your app has lots of groups and is dis displaying lots of data and you are trying to fix maybe one small thing, if you have a thousand different elements that are given a default name and some of them are copies of X element and copies of copies of X element and copies of copies of copies that you could see where this is going, you're going to have a mess on your hands. If you're trying to find and fix a specific thing or just update a certain element, it's going to be like trying to find a needle in a haystack and your app search tool isn't going to be of any use because you're not even going to know what to search for. Another mistake we see people making is just not using group elements in general, especially when you're building a responsive app to work on different screen sizes not using groups and just having individual elements on your pages, sometimes placed on top of each other, can create a real mess for you. And when you go and try to fix those things, you're gonna have a hard time doing that unless you're using groups for more organization within your development workspace. And the last one of these I wanna touch on is using app styles. This is kind of like naming your elements within your app. Using app styles lets you create standard styles that you can apply to different types of elements throughout your app without having to individually design each element to look alike. Using styles is going to help you create a much cleaner development workspace because you can create those styles once and easily apply them to elements as you build. This is a scalable best practice because the bigger your app gets, the more important this becomes and the more time it's going to save you. All right, so those are pretty straightforward best practices from a development standpoint, and they're easy to implement if you know to implement them. But when we look at the other side, the actual performance of your app, things can get a little trickier. Before we dive into these, I want to preface that creating a well-performing and scalable app, aside from the development workspace components, it's not necessarily a black and white thing. Every single app is different. And so the way you apply these best practices we're going to talk about is going to look different for your use case than it might for someone else's. You're going to have to analyze your own app and your own needs and use cases in order to really make these best practices work for you. To give you an example of what I mean, let's kick it off with the first best practice, and that is making sure you have a properly planned database and correct relationships between data types. Think about your database as your app's system. It is the foundation of your app, and it is one of the most important things you can spend time on. Now, the thing is, you can structure your database in so many different ways, but you have to do so correctly and consistently. The consistency is really important here. I mean, imagine the email system you use, like Gmail, having no underlying system to it. Imagine some things being labeled, some things being archived, some things being deleted, but with no real system or consistency to any of that. If there was no structure in place for how we as users can interact with that data, we're going to have a hard time using it in the first place. So if you have things like duplicate records, missing values, incorrect relationships, all those things affect your app's overall functionality. And because it's up to you to create the right database structure, it can be easy to get these things wrong. Along those same lines, it's really easy to overbuild 
your database. If you overbuild your database, you can be making it harder for Bubble to search through and filter through data. There's a balance to all of this, and there are things you can do to help Bubble work more quickly and by default give users a better performance experience. Another best practice is making sure you are using option sets correctly within your app. Option sets are a feature in Bubble that let you create predefined lists of choices within your app. Let's say you don't use option sets correctly or at all. And instead, when you are asking for information from your users, you let them enter their own inputs in certain situations. So let's say you're asking for the country in which they live. Well, they might end up saying something like USA or US or United States. For better performance, you want to give the specific option for them instead of letting them create their own. This is a big performance helper because option sets aren't actually a part of your app's database. And it's really great for consistency and perceived performance from a user's perspective when they're not having to sift through a bunch of different variations of the same type of data. On the flip side, performance is affected by the way you design your app as well. You can have certain layouts, for example, that work really well with a small amount of content, but as your app scales, they can start performing very poorly. So you might have a directory with 10 users, for example, and the way you're displaying that works perfectly with those 10 users. But once you get to 100 users or 1000, things can start to break. We are massive proponents of starting simple and getting fancy later. But when it comes to the layouts you're creating, it's a little bit different. When you're building your app and you are just using test data, if you are not properly designing how that data will be displayed at scale, then you're not going to notice these problems that could arise later on. So while planning ahead is not always a best practice for everything, it is a best practice from this standpoint. A good example of this relates to repeating groups. If you set up repeating groups to display a small amount of test data that you have, then that layout might work perfectly. But once you start having longer lists of data, flags can start to happen. So you need to make sure to properly break up these lists or display them a little bit differently so that users don't experience those lags. All right, a few more best practices, and these actually are a little bit more plug and play. Think about plugins. As you're building your app and testing out different plugins, you're going to find that a lot of them you bring into your app, you don't actually end up using. Now, every time you add a plugin to your app, you're technically adding more code. So a good rule of thumb is to actually remove any plugins that you're not using and also decide whether you really need the plugin in the first place. Is using a third party service going to serve you better than building whatever that functionality is yourself? Another really quick hit best practice is making sure you are not loading up your pages with really large images. If these file sizes are too big, then they can cause really slow loading speeds. So either limit the amount of images that you're using or make sure you are compressing them really well. And another good rule of thumb that you might not think about is making sure you're not leaving unused elements or unused partial functionality living on your pages. Now you might be wondering why you would ever do this, but we commonly see people building out different things, creating different elements, uh, building different workflows and not yet finishing them. And so making them hidden on the pages while those things are still in development. But if you have hidden elements, those technically still need to load. And if workflows are attached to them, for example, when a page is loaded, certain elements are populated. Even though users can't see that, it's still happening behind the scenes. Now, here's the biggest, most important thing. About 99% of your app's performance and scalability depends on data. Your database structure and how you reference data throughout your app makes a massive impact. Think about 
about how you are displaying data, how you are using data and referencing it within workflows. These all have a really big effect on your app's performance. If your app is data driven, then this is going to be the big decider or influencer on whether or not you build a scalable or unscalable app. The way you ask Bubble to search for anything within your app can be done in lots of different ways. But a lot of that is dependent on how you structured your database in the first place. What did you even make available or possible from your structure? And here's a really quick hit example for you. Let's say you have a field under user for date of birth. If you need to display your user's age across your app, then you're going to need to create an expression that calculates the age every time it's displayed. Now let's look at two different ways you could do this. One might be using the current date minus the user's date of birth that would come up with the user's age. The other way you could display this might be to have the user's current age saved to a number field within your database. Now in this second variation, there's actually no calculation needed, so it's gonna be a lot faster. And instead you could just have Bubble update that number literally once per year. This takes a really lightweight operation versus the other alternative we talked about, which is gonna be a little bit heavier. Now, obviously everybody's database is going to be different. But if you want to dive into some of these more, structuring your database, creating the right front end layouts, creating the most efficient workflows, then head to coachingnocodeapps.com forward slash workshop. This workshop covers a lot more than just app structure, but it is going to take you behind the scenes with Bubble and start to lay out some of these best practices for you within an editor. This is going to be most useful for you if you are looking to go from idea to app and want to take an all-encompassing approach to making sure you are planning, building, and launching in all the right ways. So head to coachingnocodeapps.com forward slash workshop to join in on that. I hope that workshop as well as this video brings you lots of value. Thanks so much for watching and we'll see you in the next one.